Good morning. Um, my name is Alex Saragossa. I teach at the University of California, Berkeley Department of Ethnic Studies, and I want to welcome you uh, and thank you for your presence on a beautiful Friday uh, morning. Um, it's my duty to um, kind of say a few introductory remarks, but before anything else, uh, I want to thank all the people who were involved in putting this together. Particularly, I want to thank uh, uh, some of our students. Uh, Dennis, over there in the corner. Maria, who's outside the door making sure no one gets lost. Uh, um, Marisol uh, Rodriguez, you'll meet her during the reception. I hope all of you stay for the reception. Um, one of our staff people, uh, Jeannie and Zumi. And without them, this could not have happened. And we owe them a great deal of thanks. Most importantly, I want to thank my uh, co-conspirator, uh, Professor Lak Su, and you'll meet her in just a few minutes, um, who really did an incredible amount of work on putting this together. And uh, she asked me to help out only because she doesn't have a clone uh, in that respect. Um, let me begin by saying that roughly 10 years ago, roughly 10 years ago, there was a, a controversy uh, involving the Smithsonian Institution. And it had to do with the exhibit regarding the B-29 that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Uh, it became very political, uh, as some of you um, may know. And that controversy was revisited in 2003 when the Enola Gay was completely assembled and put into a facility near Dulles Airport with very minimal signage, let us say and a group from the American Historical Association, among others, uh, rekindled, if you will, the debate on how to interpret, how to represent that important date uh, in American history, a date that my um, now deceased colleague, Ron Takaki, would argue was tinged with questions of race, racism, and the like. In other words, museums were and continue to be contested sites. And this is part of a conversation that we trust will continue uh, next year as we think about other types of events that will raise the kinds of questions that will be discussed today. Uh, in the 1960s, 70s, there were calls for museums and other public institutions uh, to be more inclusive, to incorporate uh, more representation of racial and ethnic groups in the United States. And that led to a number of questions, debates, over what to include, what to, what, uh, to exclude. Uh, but it was usually couched at that time with pan-ethnic terms like Latino, Hispanic, Asian, or Asian American, Native American, that disguised, in fact, a tremendous amount of diversity within those racial ethnic groupings. In more recent times, the debates of, of uh, of, those, uh, of that period of time have provoked new challenges. And among those challenges is who is the audience now for museums, especially those that attempt to acknowledge, recognize racial and ethnic groups in the telling of American history and culture. How do you draw minorities, audience, uh, minority audiences to exhibits, to displays that to some extent or another, is in fact about them? And how do you deal with the question of accessibility to museums and to these exhibits in light of growing socioeconomic inequities of various sorts, whether it's income inequality, academic achievement gaps, and linguistic differences, uh, and the like? And finally, and I have to say that because I have a young daughter, in what ways can social media and similar technologies lessen the distance, in a manner of speaking, between museums and their patrons, especially uh, uh, patrons who come from minority backgrounds? It's in this context that uh, we present this uh, session today, a session that is compounded in many respects with just simple, practical considerations, like who's going to fund efforts of these sorts, 
uh, and uh, perhaps other uh, questions that are more of a political nature. Uh, in fact, at the Enola Gay controversy, it was no coincidence that it was 1994 when President Clinton had to contend with now a Republican-controlled Congress, which added to the practical political consideration surrounding that controversy. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Professor Laksu. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is it's really exciting for me to uh, be here. Um, it was great working with uh, uh, my colleague here, Professor Alex Sabrosa. We could not have um, this happen if it weren't for the support of the Chicano Latino Studies Program, the Asian American Asian Diaspora Program, as well as um, the Native American Studies Program, and also um, Professor Tom Bielsi, who's there in the back. So um, it's very exciting that we are bringing together the three programs um, this year to um, uh, to work on this uh, question of curating the public and race and, and indigeneity in, the, in uh, the public culture. I have the job of introducing our wonderful speakers today, and um, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce all of them in the order um, that they will be speaking. Okay. Um, as a 30-year veteran of arts administration, Eduardo Diaz is the director of the Smithsonian Latino Center. In this capacity, Dr. Mr. Diaz is responsible for fulfilling the center's mission of fostering appreciation of Latino culture by sponsoring, developing, and promoting Smithsonian exhibitions, collections, research, and public programs, both in Washington, D.C. and across the United States. Some of the more recent projects that he has overseen include the Latino DC History Project, Ceramica de, las, de los Ancestros, Central America's Past Revealed, Caribbean Indigenous Legacies Project, the Dominican Initiative, and Asian American Latino Intersections Initiative, along with um, uh, Dr. Conrad Ang, who I'll introduce in just a minute. Um, Eduardo Diaz received his BA in uh, Latin American Studies from San Diego State University and earned a law degree from UC Davis. From 1989 to 1999, he served as Director of Cultural Affairs for the City of San Antonio in Texas. In 2001, he co-founded the International Affairs uh, for the, uh, the International Accordion Festival, a free outdoor music festival, also in the city of San Antonio. After that, Diaz um, operated a small consulting firm serving arts organizations, local arts agencies, statewide advocacy organizations, and community-based organizations. And just prior to joining the Smithsonian, Mr. Diaz served as the executive director of the National Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is the largest Latino cultural center in the United States. Following um, Mr. Eduardo Diaz will be Dr. Conrad Ng. He is the director of the Smithsonian Institution's Asian American, Asian Pacific American Center. As director, uh, Dr. Ng is responsible for setting the mission and vision of the organization, leading the development of exhibitions, public programs, and digital initiatives about Asian Pacific American history, art, and culture. Since joining the Smithsonian in 2011, the center has launched several groundbreaking museum projects, including the 2010 Folklore Festival Asian Pacific Americans Program, Portraiture Now, Asian American Portraits of Encounter, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, I Want the Why American Earth, um, and Beyond Bollywood, Indian American Shape the Nation, and as well as the Asian Latino Project I mentioned earlier. Dr. Ng received his BA um, in Philosophy and Ethnic Studies from McGill University, an MA in Cultural, Social, and Political Thought from the University of California, and a PhD in Political Science from the University of Hawaii. Prior to joining the Smithsonian um, Institution, Dr. Ng was a professor at the University of Hawaii's Academy for Creative Media and also the curator of film and video at the Honolulu Museum of Art. And then next to um, Dr. Conrad Ng is Dr. Sven Hawkinson, a native Alutik, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, 
Um, he is Associate Pro Professor of Anthropology at the University of Washington and a Curator of Native American Anthropology at the Burke Museum. Dr. Hawkinson received his BA from the University of Alaska at Fairbanks, Alaska, at Fairbanks and an MA and PhD from Harvard University. From 2000 until his appointment at the University of Washington, he had served as the Executive Director of the Aleutik Museum in Kodiak, Alaska, under his leadership, the museum served as a traveling resource, bringing innovative exhibitions, educational programming, and field research to the landlocked villages throughout the island of Kodiak. The museum provided him a unique universe, uh, opportunity to cultivate collaborative relationships with museums throughout the world, whose holdings include ancient Aleutic artifacts. Bridging cultures and continents, he orchestrated the exhibition and acquisition of Aleutic masks and other artifacts dispersed throughout Russia and France in the 18th and 19th centuries. As anthropologist, Dr. Hutchinson is currently leading a large-scale study of the sacred Aleutic uh, site to identify and archive petroglyphs and stone carvings from the southern coast of Kodiak Island. Also as skilled carver and talented photographer, his masks and images depict a way of life rarely seen outside of that region. In 2007, um, Sven Hawkinson received the prestigious MacArthur Award in recognition for his work in preserving and reviving indigenous language, culture, and customs. <clears throat> Lastly, but not, <clears throat> and, and I'll end uh, equally important, is um, Dr. Sherry Hundorf. She will be the discussant for this uh, panel, and she received her PhD in comparative literature from New York University, and she is currently the professor of Native American Studies in the Department of Ethnic Studies here at UC Berkeley. She re her research focuses on visual and literary culture, um, including the histories and racial politics of exhibition and display. She's the author of two books, Going Native, Indians and the American Cultural Imagination, and Mapping the Americas, the Transnational Politics of Contemporary Native Culture. And she's also the co-editor of three volumes, including Indigenous Women and Feminism, Politics, Activism, Culture, which is the winner of the Canadian Women's Studies Association Prize for Outstanding Scholarship. Currently, she's working on a manuscript tentatively titled Indigeneity and the Politics of Space, Gender, Geography, Culture. Please join me in welcoming our four guests. Thank you so much for being here. Buenos dias a todos. I'm happy to be here at UC Berkeley. Um, although I guess technically I'm across the street, but um, I'm happy to be here. I uh, went to uh, law school at UC Davis. <clears throat> there was a daily shuttle that uh, used to take <clears throat> grad students to and from Davis uh, to Berkeley. So every time I wanted to reconnect a little bit with urban civilization, you know, I would uh, come down here and hold up over here at Bolt Hall, which is just across the street, so I remember this place so very well, lots of fond memories. I, I want, I'm very grateful uh, to, to Locke and Alex and Tom Bielsi for the, for the invitation. Um, and I think we're going to have some fun this morning, some, uh, some amazing work that's being done by uh, the panelists, my co-panelists. Co I'm looking forward to hearing and interacting with them, uh, with them all. And I want to thank the students here and those of you who are from, uh, from the AAAS uh, conference that's taking place in San Francisco. Uh, for also being here, because I know there's a lot of interest and a lot of excitement happening in the Bay Area because of that. <clears throat> I'm just going to quote something real quick. Uh, in the 21st century, a demographic transition in American society positions Latinos as the largest ethnic group in the country. Yet for many Americans, Latinos remain shadowy ciphers, notably absent from narratives of American art. This legacy of absence in museum exhibitions, permanent collections, art history canons, and art discourse is slowly being replaced with new knowledge that frames Latino art as part, as an integral part of American art." End quote. This quote is from a lead essay of a catalog that accompanies an exhibition that just opened at the Smithsonian American Art Museum entitled Our America, the Latino Presence in American Art. The exhibition is now traveling 
is currently at the uh, Frost Museum at the at Florida International uh, University in Miami, Florida. Uh, the essay was written by Tomas Ibarra Frausto, who was a very recognized uh, scholar and art collector who is retired and currently uh, living in San Antonio, Texas. Um, our America uh, presents a very rich and very um, the contributions of Latino um, artists in the United States since about the mid-20th century to today, uh, when the concept of, uh, of a sort of a collective Latino identity uh, was beginning to emerge. Uh, the exhibition draws entirely from the collection of the museum, I'm proud to say, and explores how Latino artists have uh, shaped the artistic movements of their day and recalibrated themes, actually, uh, in American art and culture. Um, there's 92 works in the piece, uh, in, in the exhibition, I'm sorry, uh, by the 72 artists. Uh, this includes um, artists who work in various, uh, lots of styles that we would associate with being American, right? Um, a lot of people, they're, they're activists, they're, they're doing conceptual work, they're doing abstract impressionism, performance art, along with more sort of classic American genres of, of landscape and, 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 and portraiture. We know at the time, uh, during the Chicano movement, during the civil rights movement in the 70s, 60s, late 60s and 70s, uh, that a lot of artists were galvanized by this movement. And when they started um, doing work, including, there's there obviously some in the Bay Area, you got and movements like Galeria de la Traza in the Mission District, the Art of Royal Chicano Air Force in Sacramento, um, that were taking form in their uh, place and forming, actually. And you have Mua Consafos, a group in San Antonio. So a, a wide range of of uh, movement, if you will, or artistic movement happened at that time in the response uh, to the movements. And of course, they were critically probing American history and popular culture, uh, revealing uh, the possibilities and the tensions of expansionism, migration, and settlement. And, and on the other hand, you had Latino artists who, you know what, they were just focused on their medium and taking risks and experimenting with things in abstraction and performance and, and installation work, just like regular American uh, American artists. So the, the exhibition then presents uh, this picture of an evolving national culture uh, that challenges expectations of what it's meant to be American and what it's meant to be quote unquote uh, Latino. I brought some brochures and they were on your um, seats and there's some extras over here, just a little brochure uh, about our America. And I encourage you to pay attention because it, and, and try and make plans to go up to Sacramento because the show then goes to the Crocker uh, beginning in September, September the 21st, in fact, it opens at the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento. will be there through uh, January uh, the 14th, and I highly recommend that you go and, and see that show. I decided I wanted to talk about our America because I think it's an appropriate strategy for curating and representing identity and sometimes race in the museum setting. In this particular case, one of the most important uh, uh, prominent American art museums. And they've referred to the strategy as sort of centering the margin. And that is bringing the works of marginalized, uh, historically marginalized communities and placing them squarely within the canon of American art. Okay? So quite by intention, the process also centers these communities, uh, these diverse communities, whether they be in this particular case, Chicano, Puerto Rican, Cuban, and Dominican, and places them um, in, uh, in, in a way that are recognizing them as distinctly American cultures, American communities. Uh, this process of centering, I think, removes, or at least in my view, helps remove uh, the sort of this label of the other that oftentimes has sidelined Latino communities and the Latino experience, I think, for far, far too many years. <clears throat> I think it's important to explore this compulsion to center the margin within the context of working in the nation's largest museums. Smithsonian is the largest cultural complex in the world. There's 19 museums, nine research centers, the National Zoo, a very large folk life festival on the mall every year, plus a record label. So there's just a lot going on. What, I think it's important to do that. It's an imperative for us to center, to tell the, the historically complete stories of long established communities like the Chicano community and, and, and the less established communities, the newer ones like the Dominicans, for example, who today are very actively involving in negotiating that space between country of origin and community of, of residents. And I also want to tip my hat to Asian Pacific American Center at the Smithsonian because we're not the first one out of the box in trying to center uh, an experience that's been marginalized. Um, um, Block, uh, Block mentioned, I think, Portraits of Encounter. I think, yeah, it, that's a place between 2001, I'm sorry, 2011 and 2012, and it was part of, portrait, of a series called Portraiture Now at the National Portrait Gallery. 
And I was really struck by, in fact, we're following in their footsteps and sort of are leading the way for us because this August we hope to open up a show called Staging the Self, which is about identity formation within a Latino context. And we're following on the, the very um, commodious boots that, 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 that are to be filled uh, that, that, that Conrad and his group at uh, center have left behind. So in that show, what's interesting to, for me to see was how Asian American artists are presenting contemporary portraiture in a classic American way. Portraiture is a classic genre. And what this show does is it centers Asian American experience at the National Portrait Gallery. So it's not some kind of weird show, you know, art by some kind of weird people out there. No, this is Asian American community. These are Asian American artists that are reflecting the experience of the community. Period. End of story. No, 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 nothing to marginalize. It's part of the story. So I think, you know, look, the Smithsonian is not an ethically specific institution. Although, you know, we could argue that it is, given this predominant Western European uh, prism and the history of neglect of, of communities of color. And, and for sure, you know, obviously, you all know that there's the National Museum of the American Indian that was uh, established in 2004. The National Museum of African American History and Culture will get scheduled to be open in November 2015, possibly 16. So at least these two foundational uh, communities of color are represented, histories told, uh, creative expressions revealed, uh, culture celebrated, objects collected, and so forth. Um, but we've got, uh, you know, we've got a ways to go in terms of Asians and Latinos, in my, in my view, in terms of really staking the claim there. And it's true that the Smithsonian operates the National Museum of African Art and the Fear Sacro Galleries. Uh, these, but I would say that these museums are practically entirely focused uh, on Africa and Asia, uh, respectively, uh, with minimal focus on the diasporas originating from those two continents. So we have work to do to make sure that people understand that we're not talking about Asia, per se. We're not talking about Latin America, per se. We're talking about Asian Pacific Americans and Latino Americans, the US Latino uh, community. So this work of the center is about promoting presence within the Latino, within the, within the Smithsonian Institution. And I should note that Carmen Ramos, who was the, the curator of the Sour America exhibition, is one of six Latina Latino curators that we are hiring at the Smithsonian. Um, to help embed, uh, um, um, you know, curators uh, within 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 the unit within the various uh, museums. Why why is that important? Well, I would point out that of the 92 works that are in the show, our America, 68 percent of them were collected by were collected by Carmen. She's been at the work at this work for three years. So without sort of an active, dedicated curator, we are unable to bring the full measure of the Latino experience forward in the nation's museums. That's just the reality of working in museums. What well, curators are the ones that, that uh, did, um, guide research. They're the ones that organize exhibitions. They're the ones that inform public and educational content that's correlative to the exhibition, same way with web content. They're the ones that build co collections. And if they're not on the ground working in an inside way, it's very difficult for us to get this kind of um, this kind of work done. Um, so it's, you know, key that we remember to do that, to work in a museum setting in a way that embeds us within that structure. Otherwise, we're, it's going to be very, very difficult for, for us to get these kinds of exhibitions and the kind of, and the kind of work that the, that the APAC does, the Asian Pacific American Center does at the Smithsonian. Oh, and I wanted to just talk a little bit about the significance and impact of intergroup co collaborations at the Smithsonian because I think from a museum standpoint, they loom uh, more and more important, at least from my perspective. When I talk about my work, one of the things I always say is that, you know, that, that the diversity of the Latino community, which was mentioned here earlier, that there's internal diversity within the Latino community that is wondrous in the way in which it provides opportunities. Also, you know, a lot of work because we're just all over the place in terms of our, our backgrounds. You know, we are native, Latino community. Uh, we are Asian, and we are African, and we're also, of course, European. And, and sometimes it's all mixed up into one person, right? And one community. So there's a lot of Mexicanos. Uh, we hired a, a, a woman whose grandfather, quote unquote, a Chicana, right? Whose grandfather's uh, Japanese. So, I mean, you know, you have these sort of confluence Afro Latinos. That's a whole other area. So there's a whole. There, there's, there's a lot to the Latino community that on the face of it, you can't say, oh, well, that's Latino. Well, yeah, it is, but what's, what's deeper? What are, what are the cultural references? What are the histories behind that? I wanted to play a little segment, if we could go, 
to something that actually we worked with, I'll uh, just say a little bit before, before we cue it. Um, back in uh, 2012, in October, in fact, we presented a program in collaboration with the Asian Pacific American Center entitled Joe Bataan, the Afro-Filipino King of Latin Soul. Um, the other, there were other collaborators. Um, one was the National Museum of American History, the other one was the Center for Folk Latin Cultural Heritage, and the, and the actual the African American, um, no, I'm sorry, the National Museum of African American uh, History and, and Culture. So I don't know if we can cut that up. Okay. So anyway, this is just one, this is an interview clip of, of Joe talking. This is Joe I'll tell you about that. You African American talk. And when you look at that particular set of group of people and you put it all together, that's almost 80% of the world population. That's right. You see, a lot of us work on the fields together and we forget how how that NASA, when they were working on the field, field fields were there side by side with them. They were not people, they were plants also. So our history, we become ignorant. Because the uh, why Frank Lobo wrote about the uh, forgotten Filipino is because we stopped writing about the history. And of course, I had a long conversation with Hiram today, and he said, Joe, be careful. He says, learn how to document what you say. And I'm taking that advice because I understand what you're saying. Everybody can talk a big game. He said, but unless you put your apples in the basket and try to make a plan, it's probably not going anywhere. And I'm using the Smithsonian today as a springboard to try to bring all of you together, and I hope you stay for my performance. So that's Joe Batan. Uh, next to him was uh, Jeffrey Ogbar, who is an African-American scholar and, and teaches at uh, UConn, University of Connecticut. Uh, some of you, particularly those of you who are in the Asian community, probably recognize Lovie Miyamoto, who was, uh, is a uh, very active um, in the early days and still continues uh, as an activist and performance artist. Uh, Mickey Melendez uh, is the author, is an author and former member of the Young Lords Party. The Young Lords was a, uh, a movement, a Puerto Rican movement that uh, separate, uh, independence oriented uh, movement in New York. So he meant, uh, Joe mentions a concert and it was quite a concert. And I'll play a little bit of Joe Batani, just probably thinking, I want to hear some music, but I'll play it for a second. So let me say, uh, how many of you ever heard Joe Batani? All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so the Afro-Filipino king of Latin soul. So let's uh, let's unpack a little bit. So Joe's father is Filipino, and his mother an immigrant. His mother is African American, whose family was from the South, I believe, North Carolina, and of course they're they're, they're from, from a slave background. So Joe grew up in East Harlem, which is also known as Spanish Harlem, which is also known as El Barrio, right? So technically, my ancestry, Joe Badan, is Afro-Filipino. But if you ask Joe what he is, culturally, he says I'm Puerto Rican. So makes sense, right? So Latin soul, what do we know about Latin soul? It's a musical genre. Um, we know that it emerged from the social, political, cultural environment that flourished in New York City in the late 60s and, and the early 70s. It's a fluid mix of soul, Dua, Boogaloo, Salsa, and Disco. And so since I placed in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, and in New York, what else, uh, what else can you tell me about what shaped it? What, was, what were, and this is a question to you, what was, what was happening culturally, politically, socially, in that city during that time frame? Anybody want to take a guess? Late 60s, early 70s, New York City. Okay, civil rights, right? I mean, the civil rights movement uh, was happening, uh, and you had the Black Panthers were active, the Red Guard was active, Red Guard, um, the Young Lords were active, Chicano movements were happening on this side, not so much in New York, obviously. So you had a lot of um, things going on. Harlem is located next to El Barrio, right? So you had a lot of interethnic coupling uh, coupling taking place. Multi-ethnic coalitions were being built. Puerto Ricans and other Latinos were becoming more acculturated and desiring more, more agency. Um, you know, Latin soul needs to be understood uh, within that social and political context. It's not just, uh, uh, you know, 
it doesn't just end up by itself. I mean, Joe Badan just doesn't start playing this music. He's a product of this experience, and that's why I think it's so important to recognize. I'm just going to play a little bit. Do you have it queued up? So this is this is a little bit this is a Latin swing, disco style. Music. Washington Heights, you're African American. I'm sorry. 
You know, I mean, that's that's the reality of, of what we're talking about. So there was this pregnant pause there by the elevator, and I and I recognized, I quickly assured them when I was right running into them. I said, look, don't worry about it. We're going to continue to serve the Dominican community. They're part of our community. Uh, what you know, we're going to continue to do it because that's what we do, right? Um, interestingly enough, the the folks from the African American. Um, we use uh, History and Culture Museum are going to work with us on a, thing, on a project that looks at Afro Puerto Rican uh, communities in, in, in the, on the island. So, anyway, I, I just, you know, I want to jump back real quickly to Joe Baton before I, before, I, before I finish and just say to you that, um, you know, it's real critical that, from my perspective, that we continue to work with, with, with Conrad Ng and, and the Asian Pacific American Center because. Um, these, these communities have come together very interestingly uh, for many, many years now. And one of the things that we're exploring in this collaboration with the Asian Pacific American Program initiative is to look at this issue of urban culture and how we, um, how we have come together and how we have responded to American popular culture in the same way that Joe Biden did uh, in, in, in developing and being the king of Latin soul. Um, I mentioned the first contact piece. It's really critical for us uh, to. This is a collaboration with the National Museum of the American Indian. Uh, there was a, a Ceramica de los Ancestros exhibition that um, Locke mentioned, where we're looking at indigeneity in Central America. And the challenge there is, well, you know, there's Mexico, so the Aztecs, the Totonacos, the Maya, the Olmecas, et cetera, et cetera. Next thing you know, we're through the Incas, right? And so well, what happened? In the middle, and I, what people ask me what the show is, and I say, well, it's about what's in the middle. You know, this is this is the seven countries of Central America. These weren't some kind of Mayan knockoff cultures. You know what I'm saying? They had their own thing going on, and we needed to look at it. Plus, three of the ten largest Latino populations in this country are Central America: Salvador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Latin American border. So we have to serve the entire the entire um, the entire community. So. Here, again, we're looking at indigeneity very, very seriously in collaboration with the National Museum of, uh, of the American Indian. They have, and they have 12,000 pieces of Central American uh, derivation that they hardly did anything with, and this exhibition really allowed them the opportunity to do it. We were more than happy to collaborate. So this one, we're looking at first contact and indigeneity in the Caribbean. Again, we go back to the American Indian because they have the goods. They have Taino pieces. And there are great collections in the, in the islands and sometimes in the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Puerto Rico in particular. So I think it's real important that we continue to look at the issues of indigeneity. From a Latino perspective, we have to because we're part of, that's part of our uh, experience as well. How many of you know that there's a, a, a move afoot to establish a national museum of the American Latino? Wow, but the news doesn't get out here in the West Coast? I mean, what's going on? I mean, I know, I know. Look, it's fine because if I was living here, I wouldn't want to know what's going on in D.C. And frankly, nothing goes on in D.C. as you can well, that you well see because Congress can't agree if it's cloudy or, or blue sky today. So, I mean, it's, um, you know, regardless of what happens with that museum, the work of the Latino Center, if, if, if there's a move afoot to build a Asian American museum on, on the Mall, Conrad and his crew have a job to do, and that is to ensure Asian, Asian American presence at the Smithsonian. That's what we will continue to do. So, um, you know, centering all of this experience from the colonial period, uh, to the presence, it's a lot to do. We hope to travel a show that looks at the Asian American, I mean, sorry, the, the Latino, Latino experience. Um, we're developing a show now called Somos Americanos and Visual History of Latino USA, which we hope to bring to a museum near you. Uh, I hope we get it right, and I'm sure that you will tell us if we do. Thank you so much.